summary then of a lot of different uh, dog genetics, the genetics of individual traits can be relatively simple. Simple Mendelian gene for leg length, for example. Relatively small uh, numbers of genes likely controlling several of the other differences. At the same time, different genes controlling the growth of different bones. And I think it's that combination of factors that makes it possible for breeders to do what they do. There's different genes acting in different body parts. They have major effects on morphology. You can pick a body part that you want to modify, choose, uh, choose variants that occur, and selectively breed from those in order to generate uh, dramatically different forms. So for both Tiacente and for dogs, uh, selective breeding can generate uh, very large changes in a short amount of time. So let's stop there and uh, be happy to take questions. Yeah. Um, for like modern day breeders, when they're breeding dogs, do they look a lot at genetics or is it just more physical features that they try to cross just like pictures? So the question is how much um, molecular genetics guides current uh, dog breeding. I think that the breeders that uh, you saw interviewed here weren't using results from DNA to try to decide the particular dam and sire that they were, uh, that they were going to choose for the next generation. You could do that now. So they're, uh, in an organized program, if you wanted to try to speed the process, you could use molecular markers to try to screen progeny for those that might uh, carry a chromosome of particular interest. But historically, it's all been done based on just looking at animals and choosing phenotypically the ones that have a little more muscle definition in the rear or uh, taller ears or shorter ears, uh, et cetera. Yeah. Um, you said that dogs have different genes that control upper, the upper and lower jaws. Right. Um, is there any evolutionary advantage to um, that? Is there an evolutionary advantage to be able to choose, uh, change different bones differently? I think the question for uh, jaws is an interesting one because you're worried about the mismatch uh, between the teeth on the upper jaw and the lower jaw, and you would think that normally those two traits uh, would, would go together. In fact, what it looks like, if you look at the amazing variations in bones and patterns that vertebrates are able to achieve, they achieve that because they have a modular genetic control over what's happening in each little bone uh, throughout the skeleton. And that makes it possible to tweak and change cartilage and bone into all kinds of useful adaptations for running and hopping and swimming and flying and chewing and uh, running faster, et cetera. You have to be able to encode those differences somehow in the genome. So it's done by a very scattered genetic system with selection deciding that's a fit combination or that's a fit combination and uh, thereby producing the overall forms that are seen in animals. Uh, I understand like how you get from Tiacente to the regular maize corn. However, how do you make like different varieties of that corn? And was maize available like back then? Like how did they know what genes that can make the Tiacente be a maize corn? Right. So again, and Sean got several questions too about whether the mutations and the variations know what they're going to have to become. They don't. So the variation occurs at random in all different directions. It's really uh, either artificial selection by humans or natural selection looking for fit variants that decides out of all of the random variations that occurred, this one uh, is a feature that a human breeder would like or this is one that has survived better, left more offspring. It may only be a small survival difference, five or 10 percent as uh, Sean mentioned, but that random variation and then choosing based on appearance or based on fitness is what generates the different uh, breeds or stocks naturally. And then uh, in modern day times, people are hard at work trying to improve corn yields using uh, all sorts of genetic techniques, including uh, breeding, monitoring chromosomes, and sometimes now inserting genes that might improve resistance to, uh, to pests that uh, consume the crops, uh, et cetera. So the, the modifications we see today are a mixture of old and new techniques, but the old techniques have already been able to achieve uh, remarkable things. Yeah? You'd think that uh, the upper and lower jaw genes would be linked, but uh, they're not. Um, do any problems arise while breeding dogs or, uh, or even corn with uh, linked genes? Right, so that's a great question uh, about whether the kinds of mismatches that can sometimes come up in these uh, different dog breeds uh, create uh, problems. That actually uh, is true that there are dog breeds that now have such uh, morphological extremes 
that uh, if it weren't for humans helping, uh, there are some dog breeds that now are uh, usually delivered by cesarean section because of the mismatch between the offspring and the birth canal of the, of the parents, for example. So it is true that um, artificial breeds uh, are sometimes selected for traits uh, that would reduce their overall uh, viability, which actually is a great transition into what we're going to talk about uh, in the next section. So I think uh, uh, thanks for all the questions, and we'll, we'll start the next section because in the next section we're going to talk about selection under a full range of fitness constraints uh, in the wild. Okay, so in nature, there isn't a human there helping you along uh, to be born or to serve you a particular kind of food. You really have to be fit and more fit than anybody else in order to, to survive, survive and adapt. And that brings us back to uh, Darwin's key analogy. Uh, he knew that artificial breeders had been able to achieve major changes uh, in body form. Uh, by, by selective breeding, and he argued that natural species would also uh, be able to change in dramatic ways and that natural selection would be able to transform wild plants and animals based on differences uh, in fitness. So for the rest of the talk, I'd like to um, focus on evolution not in human cornfields or in dog kennels, but uh, evolution subject to a full range of fitness constraints in natural environments and to introduce the organism that we'll be talking about, uh, I have a short video. This actually um, is an actual episode of Jeopardy that aired uh, two or three weeks ago. This is Jeopardy. And now, Alex Trivet. is looking at me like I'm weird because we're going into double Jeopardy with these categories. These are going to be fun. World capitals, followed by movies to the max. Almost assassinated. American women, furred, feathered, finned. And uh, finish the category 2000. It may ring a bell that this capital of Belize also starts with Bell, B-E-L. John. Where's Belmopan? Belmopan, that's right. Let's try uh, furred, feathered, fin for 400, please. The brown type of this pouched bird plunges from the air to fish. The white one scoops up fish as it swims. John. Where's a pelican? Right. Uh, for 2000. The dorsal spines give this fish seen here its name. And it is a stickleback, stickleback fish. John. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now I've got to ask you guys. How many of you would have known uh, the pelican? How many of you would have known uh, the capital of Belize? <laughs> you should get a t-shirt. Um, <laughs> How many of you would have known the three-spine stickleback? A few. Okay, so let, let's talk more about this small fish that's uh, now famous enough to have actually made it onto Jeopardy. But on the other hand, was the 2000 rather than the $400 question on Jeopardy and was obscure enough that it stumped all of the contestants, even the ones who knew the capital of Belize. Okay, so this uh, stickleback is a small fish. Um, the ancestral form is found uh, in oceans, about three inches long. Sticklebacks, uh, although they live in oceans, are like salmon. So they migrate into freshwater uh, streams every year to spawn. So these uh, ocean fish are constantly migrating and probing uh, freshwater environments along the coast. That lifestyle has been key to an enormous evolutionary radiation of the fish that actually um, plays upon one of the factors that Sean mentioned in the first lecture, and that's the enormous environmental changes that have occurred uh, in the Earth over time. What's shown in blue here are these huge ice sheets uh, that used to cover North America uh, during the time of the La Brea tar pits, uh, for example, Ice Age animals that Sean was showing. So about 15,000 years ago, those large ice sheets started to melt, and that set off uh, an evolutionary radiation that's uh, summarized uh, in the next environmental video. Okay, so during the, the Ice Age, these huge sheets uh, covering uh, lots of land mass, ice was incredibly thick, so mile-wide mile, uh, thicknesses of ice pile on 